this is missions conference, but you told me to mind the Lord. I told you to mind God. Right. And uh, I got a healthy fear right now because I'm scared to death. It's a message I have preached before. It's been a while. But I, I don't feel like I need to deal with missions tonight, if that's okay. Let's turn over to Nehemiah chapter 1. Don't want to mind the Lord. Can't help you if I try to do things my way. Let's look in Nehemiah chapter number 1. The Lord allows we'll get back to the missions tomorrow. Well, honestly, anything in God's Word, I believe, points to missions, don't you? You find your place there. Stand with me. Just for a moment. Nehemiah chapter number 1. Now the words of Nehemiah the son of Hashkaliah. And it came to pass in the month Cheslu in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace. that Hanani one of my brethren came and he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also uh, wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them from the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name, and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Lord, I want to ask you tonight to touch my heart. You know this has been a while since I've dealt with this, but I really feel this is your direction. And I want to be a help to your people. And I pray you help me, and speak through me, and just call things to my mind. And Lord, I pray that we'll open your our hearts to you that we'll receive your word and apply it today. God, if there's one here struggling, I pray you help them. One here lost, I pray they get born again before we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. I'm not going to take time to give a long introduction, but I will quickly tell you what's going on here. The children of Israel had been disobedient. We could go through everything, but they've been disobedient to God and they've been in captivity. Uh, and the Lord had uh, allowed them to come out of captivity, but some, some remained there uh, in, uh, in, uh, Bab in, in Babylon, and some went back to Jerusalem. Uh, you have to think, you say, well, why would they remain there? Well, a lot of them born there. A lot of them, that's all they ever knew. And so they stayed there, but then some did go back to Jerusalem. And uh, Nehemiah got uh, curious, got wondering about what was going down in, going on down in Jerusalem and so he asked and as he asked this question about what was going on in Jerusalem he received some news that was unexpected right. Nehemiah's home was Babylon but he still had concern over Jerusalem that was the homeland that was his heritage that was his people he knew that they had been trying to rebuild and Nehemiah wanted to know, hey, what, what's going on down there? Remember, they didn't have cell phones and Facebook and internet and all those things. I, I mean, it was hard to communicate from a distance and, and to know and they were no posting pictures of progress that was going on down there. So he didn't know. 
And he asked, and I believe, it, I believe it with all my heart when he asked, he was expecting to hear some great things. Everything's going well down in Jerusalem. You know, God allowed us to come out of captivity. The Lord's really blessing. We got everything built back. And I mean, uh, the economy's flourishing. Everybody's doing well. Everybody's healthy, wealthy, and wise. And that's why he asked. That's what he wanted to hear. How beautiful things were. How everything was going well. So he asked Hananiah about them. But this is what he heard. They're in great affliction and reproach. They are not living in peace and happiness. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The walls aren't standing. They don't have any protection for their city. The gates are burned with fire. It's pretty much like it has been for a long time. Now get a hold of what that meant. Under great distress, they're under affliction. Again, no protection. Any outside uh, invaders or any of the enemies had free reign to do whatever they wanted to to those people. They lived in fear. They lived in worry and they, they, they were unable to defend themselves. Husbands not able to really uh, defend their families like they'd like to. And anything of value would be taken. Uh, they couldn't, I mean, there was just, it was just a sad, sad state. They were at the mercy of whoever came after them. And they were just barely getting by. It's not what he expected to hear. It's not what he was looking for. Has that ever happened to you? Something unexpected take place in life? You get some unexpected news. Maybe even today you've got something very unexpected's happened. Uh, a lot of times in my life, those uh, times when I'm thinking everything's going well and everything's going grand and wonderful and all of a sudden something that I did not expect hit me right in the face. Yeah. And sometimes there are good things that happen unexpectedly. You come in service and the pews are full. You didn't expect that. Praise God for that. But other times, tragedy comes. Loss comes. Personal struggles hurt. People that you loved come against you. You didn't expect. Broken homes, broken relationships, sickness. I could go on and on and on and list all the unexpected negative things that happen in life. But they happen. And can I tell you tonight, just because you're saved does not make you immune from these things happening to you. Back a few years ago, this world was hit with an unexpected event, wasn't it? A virus that turned the world upside down. My dear old dad, I was over in Wales and he got, he got COVID and he had lung issues, he had heart issues and we were thinking he was going to be alright. But the last few days of his life, they said, no, he's taking a turn for the worse. And I got to spend my, his last days with him on FaceTime. It wasn't what I expected. And man, it still hurts today. But those things come. We all have expectations. How many of you got plans for tomorrow? How many of you making plans? I know our missionary here tonight is making plans for a year or two down the road. Goals you got that you want to accomplish, things you want to achieve. James says, go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is a, even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We all have expectations, but let me tell you something. You don't know what's going to happen from one minute to the next. Life is full of unexpected occurrences. And I want to do my best tonight to try to be a help to you. And look at this subject, what to do when the unexpected happens. Because it's going to happen. I feel like maybe somebody tonight is going through that. I don't know that, but maybe you're about to. Notice the example God gives us here. Verse 4, and it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down. Nehemiah heard the bad news. And what did he do? He collected himself. What do you mean by that? He was hit with multiple emotions when he heard what was going on in Jerusalem. Man, he was, he was hit with pain and sadness and frustration, worry. This was the lives of people that he loved, the land that he loved. And how easy would it have been for him to get mad, lash out, begin to question God. God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why did you allow us to go back down there, our people to go down there and live in such a way? Why are you doing this to us? 
He could start pointing blame at others and blame all those people down in Jerusalem. Why don't you do something? Why hadn't you got it done? He could have done all those things. But as soon as he heard this news, he sat down without saying anything. And even though emotions were flooding through his mind, through his heart, through his life, he was full of different thoughts. He was just like you and I. But I love how the Word of God is playing as He gives us this account. And He said He just sat down. See, emotions are natural, especially when you get bad news. It shows you have compassion. It shows you are a normal human being to have emotions. We all have emotions that flood our hearts when something like this takes place, when something bad takes place, when some, some horrible obstacle comes in your life. Some people think, well, you just got to let it go and get on past it. That sounds wonderful, but sometimes that's just not how it works. I understand that, and hey, it's easy for me to go to Brother Mark and him, him hit with something unexpected, him going through a trial and say, Brother Mark, you're just going to have to pick yourself up and get over it. But I ain't the one going through it. That's easier said than done. Sometimes we get bothered by things. Bad news brings bad feelings. And when the unexpected brings a change in your life, it's natural to have some feelings about it. It's natural to get broken about it. It's natural to have some anger about it. But the key is right here to properly handling ourselves when the unexpected happens. Do not let your emotions start to drive your actions. It's natural to have the emotions. But our flesh wants us to react on those emotions. How many times do we open our mouth when the unexpected happened, when something bad happened, when something came against us, we opened our mouth filled with emotion and wish we could have taken, taken back those words that we said. Taken back the action that we took that made the situation much worse than it ever had to be. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Said something we regret. We let our emotions speak before we really thought, sat down, collected ourselves, got a hold of our emotions. Again, emotions are natural, but we got to get them under control. We get angry. We react in anger. Another wise word of Solomon, a wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. We end up stirring up more strife when we let our emotions guide us. See, that's the way the world works today. They all go by feelings. Just do go how you feel. If I went how I felt, I'd be in a sad shape today. Natural to have emotions, but we've got to be careful to just sit down. Don't say a word. Get off to herself and gather those emotions. Because if we don't stop and collect ourselves during the unexpected, those emotions will act out and it will drive us towards sinful actions, reacting with our own reason and not the way the Lord would have us to. How many of you are guilty of letting your emotions drive you before you took time to collect yourself? Somebody says something to you that hurts you. You know what our natural thing is? Let's say something back that's worse. A family member comes against you. A church member comes against you. Or, or whatever it may, it may be that comes up as an obstacle in your life and you immediately want to say something about it. The best thing to do is what Nehemiah done. He sat down and he gathered himself. Collected himself. Unexpected news will cause us to want to quit. You remember Elijah? You read the thread on his life. I, I mentioned this the other night at church. But that was a legitimate threat. This was Ahab's wife. Jezebel. And the fact that he got off alone dwelling on the negatives and he got depressed. He started letting those emotions fill him. Yeah, he got off by himself, but he was reacting in emotion. And the craziest thing in the world happened. He was running for his life, but then he asked God to kill him. He was not thinking right. Filled with emotion. And he got down and depressed. And can I, 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 don't, I hope Brother Mark don't mind me saying this because a lot of, you hear a lot of preachers say it ain't real in Christians, but depression is real in Christians. Amen. Depression will happen to a saved person if we're not careful. Right. Those emotions get heavy and get weighing down upon us and we'll get in that depressed state and there's no telling what we might do. Right. Elijah, a great man of God, used in mighty ways, but he got down and out and he got, his emotions flooded him and he was saying things that didn't even make sense. When things don't go according to plan, our emotions can get overwhelmed and make us think we'll just give up and quit. 
or we want to lash out. I'm done, it's over, I'm giving up, I'm giving up on them, I'm giving up on this, I'm giving up on that. Our emotions are dangerous, that's why we cannot rely on them, we have to sit down and collect ourselves. He that trusted in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. As we look at the context of that verse, we can see Solomon is meaning, uh, what it, when he says heart, he's talking about that inward person that where those emotions start to churn up and, and become to, uh, a place where they might spill out. And when we trust in those, we're subject to foolishness, flying off the handle, quitting, letting, uh, letting go, lashing out, making a situation worse than it already is. I think about times in my life when troubles hit and my emotions stirred. And not that I lashed out, not that I'd done anything hard to anybody, but my emotions drove me to try to fix it when I had no ability to fix it. And when you don't know how to fix something, you know what happens when you tinker with it? You make it worse. And there's been a lot of times that unexpected things, troubles have come and problems have come and I've, I've tried to fix them on my own and messed them up and I should have just sat down and gathered myself. I don't know what you might be going through tonight and the emotions flooding through your heart, through your mind. Don't let them control you. Sit down. Gather yourself. Amen. While he was sitting there, then we find he cried. And it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down. He was collecting him and wept and mourned certain days. He started to cry. This grown man, the king's cupbearer, a man of position, started to cry. Can I tell you this this evening? Weeping does not mean you're weak. It does not mean you're vulnerable. Right. Crying means you're a human being and you care. Amen. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, To everything there's a season and a time and every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. There are times when just having a good cry is what we need. I said we need to collect ourselves, gather our emotions, but we might need to weep and let out some of that frustration, let out some of those emotions. There are times when we need to weep. Weeping, again, is not weakness. It's natural. It's biblical. David wept over Absalom's death. It says, And the king was much moved and went into the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went thus, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. He wept. He cried. Why? Because he got unexpected news. He got a problem in his life. He had a loss. It was his son. He went off to himself and began to weep and cry. Job wept over his situation. He said, My face is foul with weeping. Jeremiah wept over his people. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes were found, or found, I'm sorry, my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep a day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jesus Christ himself wept. I believe he was weeping over those of little faith. But weeping's a natural thing. And when bad news or unexpected news comes in our lives, there's a time we need to sit down and collect ourselves and just cry. It may be that you need to cry right here on the altar. Maybe that you need to go, go off to yourself and just have a good cry. You say, I ain't never heard anything like this. Let's just, I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says he done. Weeping is natural. You know what? It, I found some stuff a good while back when I looked at this that it, it self soothes you to weep. It can physically release endorphins that help deal with pain. It helps you to deal with the circumstance. Have you ever just needed to have a good cry? Yeah. It helps release the stress, the, the, the weight, the problem that you're facing. And it's okay to do this. It, it does not, again, it does not show that you're weak. It is not wrong to go and weep over problems in your life. The pressure of an unexpected situation brings, it can get heavy and sometimes you just got to let it go. Let it out. Nehemiah shows us that taking time to weep and to mourn, he says, for certain days helped him to deal with the emotions that came from unexpected news. You know what we'll find in a moment? We'll see he was able to think more clearly after he took this time. Us men often think weeping is not right for us, but sometimes we need to let it out. 
How many times has stress or emotional flare-ups, problems come in life, led you to chaotic thinking? What do you mean by that? You, 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 you can't get centered in on what you need to do. You don't know which step to take. You're all over the place. You want to do this, and then you want to do that. You want to say this. You want to go here. You want to go there. And there's no rationalizing anything because you're full of emotion from whatever it is stressing you. Wrath goes through. Confusion is in your mind. And you think, I'm going to take care of it my way. And we begin to sometimes... When we get overly emotional, we get so twisted in our thinking that we begin to think God is guiding us to do something that we would usually know that it can't be God doing that. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The Lord doesn't guide you in confusion in any way. Never does He guide in confusion. Matter of fact, I said this the other day. I used to always play Brother Mark. I'd say, the Lord, just please, please give me clarity. And I've come to realize He doesn't give me anything but clarity. The confusion is in me. The confusion is when I get stirred. The confusion comes when I get overwhelmed and I confuse what God is saying. When you don't take time to deal with your emotions, let them out. You'll never be clear to think right. You'll make bad situations worse. But when you take that time to cry and to mourn, to release the stress within you, to release the emotions within you, then you can better progress through whatever the problem may be. Nehemiah mourned certain days. He didn't get in a hurry to do anything about the news. He was just sitting there and mourning for days. How many days? I don't know. Certain days. But he took time to make sure he was clear before he moved on. I'm sure he wanted to just tear off and do something right away. But he didn't do it. He dealt with himself first. Our emotions a lot of times will drive us to start thinking the worst in these kind of situations. Go with me a minute. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had a problem? Something come in your life? A stress? Again, don't have time to deal with every one of them. But, but something weighing on you. And immediately in your mind, you go to the worst outcome that could ever be. And you begin to think about that. And you just know within yourself that's what's going to happen. Your nerves get to stirring. You get worried. You get, you get so bothered you don't even want to get out of bed. Because all you think about is, this is going to happen. This is going to, uh, I know that this is what's going to take place. And you worry over the worst thing that hasn't even happened yet. You got what I'm saying? We create... Fictional scenarios when problems come. Am I the only one that does? I, I do that. We do that and we get confused because we don't deal with, it, with everything we're feeling and we start creating these things. I, I remember uh, uh, do, reading about that one time in a, in a school done a study on that and they had people to, to write down all the things they worried over. And then I think it was a month later they went back to them or what the worries that they thought would come to pass and they found out that only one or two of the hundreds of things that they took down ever came to pass. But that's what we'll do. And we make it worse. And it begins to affect us physically. It affects us spiritually. There's been times, Brother Mark, that I'd go into Calvary Baptist Church and I'd sit down on my pew and my mind be somewhere else. Pastor had asked me to sing a song or something and I was so weak physically from worry. I could barely even walk up to the pulpit. Didn't have no business going up there anyway because I was so away from my, uh, where I needed to be because of the stress and the worry of unexpected things. Can't, couldn't even focus. Couldn't have peace because of worry. I'll even, I don't know why I'm saying all this. There was one time I got up to go to work and I'd, I'd put myself under so much stress and so much worry because of something that got on my mind, thinking of those things that probably never would happen. And, and, and just to jump ahead, they never did happen. But in my mind, they were going on. I got up to go to work and I made my way out the door to the front porch and I started dry heaving on the, on the porch. My head was hurting so bad I was sick. My wife came out there and said, you can't go to work. And I was trying to go on. She said, no, we're going to take you to the doctor. I went to the doctor and they checked me out and, and, and diagnosed me with migraines. But you know what all that was? It was all because of the stress of my worry and my problems going on that I was making worse because I wouldn't deal with myself. 
my emotions flooded me because of a problem. You need to sit down and gather yourself. Cry. Get, get, get a hold of yourself. And once Nehemiah did that, he gathered himself. He dealt with his emotions over all the news. And then look back at verse 4 with me. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and I mourned certain days, and fasted. And then notice what he did. After he gathered himself, after he dealt with his emotions, then he called out to God. Not emotion-filled, not angry, but after he gathered himself, then he was in a place where he could really pray. He was able to approach God and approach Him in the right way. He fasted. He was mean in business with God. He had got his emotions dealt with and now he said, Lord, it's time. I've got to have some help now. And he called out the Lord, began to uh, beg Him. He said, Lord, be attentive to my prayer. He showed God reverence. He was able to approach God in a reverent way because he had dealt with his emotions. There was no arguing with God. There was no, was, was no coming up with all these ideas, trying to present them to God. He had dealt with himself and now it was just, Lord, I'm going to lay it in your hands. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, and great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love Him and observe His commandments. Had he prayed to God when his emotions were all stirred, he would have no doubt been saying, Lord, why? Why? Why are you doing this? Why is this happening? But instead, he said, Lord, you got, you've made a covenant with us. You show mercy to us. You love us that observe your command." He began to reverence God. Nehemiah needed God and he was sincere as he called out on him after he gathered himself. He said, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. He was unselfish. Hey, when we get our emotions all stirred up, when problems come, whenever unexpected news comes, we're, we're all selfish anyway to some degree. But when problems come, we really get selfish. But he wasn't selfish. He said, for the children of Israel, thy servants. It wasn't about God. I, uh, you just don't know what I've been going through. God, you just don't understand how heavy it's been. Lord, the problem's with all of Israel, and I need you to help everybody. Yeah. He started praying for everybody involved. He wasn't calling out on God just for Himself. He wasn't looking for His will, His way, His outcome. He wasn't seeking God just to, hey, Lord, just make me feel better. But He went on the behalf of everyone involved, all of Israel, looking for the Lord to intervene in the situation. And he even took responsibility. He said, We have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We've dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor statutes nor the judgments. Because Nehemiah took time to collect his emotions, get his mind right, get his heart right. He was able to go to God in a correct manner, in an honest manner, without pride, just looking for a real solution. Our next step when the unexpected happens is just go call out to God. Call out to Him with reverence. You say, preacher, I hear that all the time. Just trust God. Just go to God when you got problems. Well, that's what the Bible says. I don't know any other thing, any other advice to give you, but that's what the Bible teaches us to do is come to Him. Amen. Knowing He's God. Knowing He is the answer. Go to Him in sincerity. Giving Him our heart. Being specific unto Him. Crying out to Him. Give Him your heart. Well, I, well, the Lord already knows everything. I understand He knows everything, but He's not going to butt into your problem. He will wait for you to come to Him with the problem and begin to pour out all that you need from Him. And once your emotions are under control, then you can pray in an unselfish manner. I don't know what you might be dealing with. It may be somebody else has stirred up something in your life. It may be some problem that involves family. It may be a problem that involves people at work. But if you'll get a hold of your emotions, you'll get a hold of yourself, you'll cry, you'll deal with yourself. When you go to pray, it won't be about, oh, woe is me. It'll be about, Lord, I don't know how to handle this situation, but I pray, God, that you'll just let everybody come out to the good. You'll let everybody be blessed. You'll just sort it out so we can all come back together. I pray, God, my enemy, you'll just bless them. You'll lift them up. Up. You'll help them through this thing. You'll pray in the right way, looking for a real solution, not just to feel good. Asking for peace to all who are involved. Isn't that right? It's what we should do. Before we deal with our emotions, our request would be selfish, wanting what we want. But once we deal with ourselves, then we can approach God right. And we also, like Nehemiah, can say, Lord, I probably hadn't done everything the right way. Lord, I, and, and, and again, not every unexpected thing, not every problem is caused by us, but when it is, we need to get to a place where we admit to God and say, Lord, I, I probably hold a little bit of the, 
of the guilt to what took place. I probably didn't handle myself right. Lord, I've made a mistake. And Lord, if you'll just help me to get back in the right way and you'll bring a solution to what I'm facing. Instead of trying to appease the situation with quick fixes, instead of trying to bear the burden all by ourselves, we can go and call upon Him when we get our hearts and our minds in the right place. When the unexpected happens, we need to call on God. Not a run-of-the-mill half-hearted prayer. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what Nehemiah did. I mean, he had wept and he had mourned certain days and he prayed before the God of heaven. And he said, I beseech thee. You know what? He had a fervent, earnest prayer. He was wanting God not to just listen or hear him, but listen and respond unto him. He meant business with the Lord. I remember times, Brother Mark, when I was a little boy, uh, services would go and go and go. I, I remember laying on the pew going to sleep because people would be flooding the altars, crying out for God to help them, crying out for God to do, wanting to do business with God, wanting God to bring them through their problem, wanting God to bring them through their valley. But now we don't, we don't have time to even approach God about things. We come down and we'll pray for 30 seconds and think everything's alright. What we do is we get it off our chest. We feel better. But when, when we get back home, everything comes right back on us. I'm talking about Nehemiah done business with God until he got a hold of God and got an answer from God. You're going through something tonight. You want a solution. You're going to have to get a hold of God and let God get a hold of you. He beseeched the Lord, praying with urgency, begging God to hear Him. And we need that in our life today. That fervency. Lord, I need to get through this. Lord, I need You to pick me up. Lord, I need You to get me on through and show me what I need to do. Nehemiah, during his unexpected news, after he had dealt with his emotions, he began to remember God's promises. He said, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But... If you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out in the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and bring them unto the place where I have chosen to set my name there. Lord, you've said, if I'll cast my burden on you, that you'll help me. You'll give me peace. You'll give me rest. Lord, you said if I come to you, you'll yoke up with me. And you'll bear that burden with me. And you'll get me through it. Lord, you promised this. And I'm bringing it to you right now. You know what the Lord does when He says those things? He obligates Himself to do exactly what He said. If you'll come to Him with that kind of fervency, with whatever you're going through tonight, He said He would give you rest. He said He would help you bear the burden. And that's what He means. He's already said, here I am. If you want me to help, I'm available. God, I just don't know what to do. Lord, I, I'm facing something tonight and I just don't know which way to go. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth unto all men liber, literally, liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. Yeah. It's a promise you can count on. It's a promise you can come to God and say, Lord, you told me if I'd come and ask for guidance, for, for wisdom, you know what I'm going through, you know what I'm facing, you know I need to know exactly what to do. You said if I ask, you'd give it to me and he will. God, I just don't understand what's going on. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. You don't know what's going on. You're chaotic in your mind. You're all twisted around. Come to God and He will show you the path to take. Amen. The psalmist said, The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. He'll deliver you tonight. Real quickly, let me say this. Nehemiah collected himself. He cried. Uh, and then he called out to God. And after that, he commenced forward. What do you mean by that? He was the king's cupbearer. He had a job to do. He couldn't just go sit down at home and say, oh, woe is me. Oh, poor pitiful me. Brother Mark, he had to keep going. Life had to still be lived. Life does not just stop because of unexpected news. Life doesn't stop because we have problems. Life goes on. There's, there's things we've got to get done. Yes, the state of Jerusalem was still the same, but, but he had to keep living. He had to keep working. He had to keep going. And we still have jobs to do. We still have a family that depends upon us. There are people who count upon us. There's lost people that, that we need to share the gospel with. And we've got to keep moving forward. And that's why we've got to do it the right way as He did it. Collect ourselves.
cry, if we've got to call out on God, and, and then we've got to just move forward. Go on. Does that mean, are you saying, well, when I call out on God, the problems, the problems disappear? I'm not saying that. They might, but they might not. But when you call out on Him and you trust Him, you've got to just dust yourself off and then commence forward and live life. Isaiah 40, verse 29 through 31, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We have to trust the Lord in unexpected circumstances because we've just got to keep going. Maybe here's the missions part. A church still got to go. As I said, lost people still got to be witnessed to. We got family dying and going to hell. They need to be prayed for. And we just got to keep going, even with the problems. And we're going to have problems. You might have one tonight, and you might deal with it, but next week there might be another one. More unexpected news. Changes don't happen overnight sometimes. We just have to wait on Him. Amen. And He begins to move, and we can be strengthened. Yeah, Chapter 2, the king, just to show you what happens real quickly. He just moves on. He was the king's cupbearer. He was expected to be at his job. And he goes before the king, and the king notices something a little different about Nehemiah. He commenced on. He kept going. But the problem was still there. And the king saw it. He, he saw, his countenance wasn't just right. He could tell something was heavy on his heart. Nehemiah tells him what's going on. And verse 4, he says, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make requests? He said, so I prayed to the God of heaven. You know what he done? He said another little silent prayer with fervency, I believe, before he spoke to the king. What happened? Nehemiah, because he collected himself, he cried, he called out to God, and he said, all right, Lord, it's in your hands. I'm going to go forward. He was beginning to see fruit of his situation being taken care of, of this unexpected news being, being taken care of. He requested the king to go to Jerusalem and rebuild. And the king sends him to do so. In this case, Nehemiah moved forward. God opened the door. And things began to change in Jerusalem. You, you, know the, you know all that took place in the book of Nehemiah. And that might happen in your situation. Very well may. But just as I said a moment ago, it may be a situation that really you bear for a long, long time. But the procedure to get through it is never different. It's always the same. See, God knows the beginning. He knows the ending. He knows what He's taking you through. And we have to trust Him with it. Move forward. Psalm 62, 8 says, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times. You people, pour out your heart before Him. God is refuge for us. Selah. At all times. You trust Him. When you can't see the other side of the storm, you say, Lord, I give it to you. I'm trusting you with it. When things are going good, Lord, things are going well right now. I'm just going to trust you because I know something's about to happen. Just trust Him and move forward. No doubt some of you have faced unexpected trials. And they took you to the point you couldn't function. You couldn't get out of bed. You couldn't go to church. Your joy just flooded out of you. But we have the Word of God giving us the plan to get over it, to get past it, to get through it. I don't know what you're going through tonight. Brother Mark, if you want to, if you want me to, if you want to handle the altar call, it'll be fine. Or if you just want to come play a song, it'll be good. But what are you dealing with tonight? Maybe some of you have been hit right in the face with something. Your emotions are dangerous and they can lead you down a wrong path to make a situation worse. And as simple as this sounds, it is the right way. Collect yourself. Cry it out and call out to God. What are you going through tonight? If you will, just bow your heads.